Welcome to the Real Estate Way to Wealth and Freedom Podcast, Episode 11. Welcome to the Real Estate Way to Wealth and Freedom Podcast with Jacob Ayers, providing actionable content to help you along your journey to financial freedom through real estate investing. As the premier asset class, real estate has helped ordinary people just like you amass fortunes. The benefits of passive income from real estate investing will allow you to live a life you want. And now your host, entrepreneur, real estate investor, and apartment deal syndicator, Jacob Ayers. Okay, welcome everybody. Today we have Jeff Greenberg. Jeff is the managing partner of Synergetic Investment Group. Since 2007, Jeff has been investing in multifamily assets in emerging markets. He focuses on acquisitions, investor relationships, contract negotiations, business systems development, business management, and asset management. Jeff has over 40 years experience in management, staff supervision, development, and training. He has proposed, elemented, and supervised million dollar budgets for government agencies, as well as private and public organizations. Today, I welcome Jeff Greenberg. Jeff, thanks for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. Absolutely. So, Jeff, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got started in real estate investing? Well, I come from a a technology background, and um, I was actually uh, uh, going going through a divorce uh, at the time that I decided to get into real estate when I kind of looked at my my assets and realized that... um, I wasn't going to re- be retiring any day soon, so I decided that uh, real estate was the way to go. Uh, tried my hand at uh, some of the different niches in uh, single-family homes, and this was about uh, 2007, and that wasn't a real good time to be uh, getting into uh, single-family homes. Certainly. So. Uh, I happened to uh, go to a, a conference where I met up with uh, someone that was doing the uh, multifamily, and that kind of uh, kind of excited me. That was a niche that that I liked uh, the extra zeros behind it. Uh, I liked the fact that you could do a lot of stuff um, with uh, limited funds that you could uh, raise private money, and uh, so I kind of got started that way. Yeah, great. What multifamily arena are you in? Are you focusing on maybe Class C, Class B multifamily? Well, mainly we're looking at B and C, but uh, it ends up mostly C for the most part. Um, But I'm also looking at student housing. Um, I currently have uh, two different uh, student housing projects, and and that's kind of uh, exciting at this point. So we are looking further into that. Student housing does well during uh, recession times. And so uh, we're putting a lot of focus on that area, along with other areas of multifamily. Yeah, right. Great. What regions of the country are you focusing on, or do you have a focus? Um, you know, we're looking, you know, somewhat in the, I guess, the south, um, I guess more southeast. I mean, we're, we're looking right now. Uh, we've got a property in Georgia. Um, we're looking at uh, a couple things in South Carolina. Um, I guess we also have uh, something up in Ohio, so I guess that's up in the a little bit farther north. Um, but uh, middle of the country, um, pretty much. Yeah, right. Great. So, Jeff, you kind of uh, started along like many people do, you know, getting started in single family houses and then, you know, realized you, you like the scalability and magnitude of multifamilies. Could you just touch on a couple of the differences in, in your experience so far well they are they are quite a bit of difference and and i even tell people that you know i don't feel there's enough difference that you need to um start out in single family homes um there's just really so much different i mean the in the multifamily or the bigger property any of the commercial properties you're essentially buying a business so you have to have an understanding of the how to run that particular business, either self-storage, multifamily, student housing, you know, um, 
you know, mobile home parks. Those are more about understanding the business as opposed to single family homes where your your value is more determined by by comps and you don't have a lot of choice on what you can do with the comps where in commercial uh, it's much more about understanding the business and what you can do to improve the business right certainly you definitely have that that added layer of flexibility and being able to be creative with you know the property or businesses you refer to so yeah great so, Jeff, could you talk a little bit about uh, your current projects you have going on and maybe share some of those details? Well, we currently uh, just closed, I guess it was uh, mid-April, um, on a student housing project. Uh, it's a little smaller than I like, but it was such a good deal that we decided we'd go for it. But it's uh, 36 units, and it was uh, – it was 60% physically occupied uh, and 48% economic uh, occupancy. Uh, it was a property that was foreclosed on, and it was held by the uh, the equity fund that held the note. And so we ended up buying it from them. Uh, it's got some fabulous potential uh, to be a, a real uh, home run home run deal because there are so many value adds that we can bring to it. And, and that's one of the main things that we're looking at right now is, is value add deals, something that we can do that can add some uh, great value to the property, increase its, uh, well, increase its value and then be able to either sell it or refi and pull most of the money out. Right. Okay. Through your company, Synergetic Investment Group, are you syndicating these multifamily deals? Yes, all the all the deals we're doing are, are syndicated. Okay, and how about uh, how are you managing them? Are you hiring third party management companies or self managing? Oh, we don't we don't self manage. No, oh, right. <laughs> we always manage. Uh, have a professional management company running it. Um, yeah, trying to trying to manage a property from uh, from California to back east um, just just doesn't do it. We love to find people that are trying to do it. In fact, I'm looking at a property right now where an investor was trying to do it. We we love getting into those because usually they're a mess, and we could come in and, and get the property at a at a, a good a good price. Right. So, could you talk a little bit about how you're able to go into a new market and establish relationships with you know local management companies and and partners there? and uh, how, you, how you're making that work? Well, we, we get references and we do inter- a lot of interviews as far as um, what, you know, what property management companies are out there and we get references to find out you know, how they're performing. Um, we've, we've found out the hard way you know, how important property management is and that's something you can't take lightly. You have to make sure you're you're watching what's going on and uh, making sure that your property management is in, in alignment with, with your goals. Um, but typically we start with the, the, uh, the uh, property management and the brokers that are bringing the deals, but we put more trust and judgment in the property management. They're going to be the ones that are going to be sticking around. The, the brokers typically, once uh, you close on the property, are long gone. They've made their commission. So their judgment, we're not going to be uh, valuing nearly as high as say a property manager when we're, when we're looking at the properties. Right. So you're looking into uh, investing in emerging markets. So are, are you and your company looking at the market first and then trying to find properties within that market that, that fit your investment criteria? Or are you looking across multiple markets and then finding the property that does first? Well, we are looking at multiple markets and um, we do want to, you know, look at a market for a reason to be there. Um, There are times that we get properties that are from a market maybe that we haven't looked into and we'll go ahead and look at the market and decide whether or not we want to go over into that market. Um, So, in fact, that's one of the, the first questions I asked my team you know, when they, they bring a property over, they say, okay, why do I want to be there? You know, what's going on in this market that makes me want to be there? 
And so I'm, I'm okay with opening up into a new market. Um, my biggest concern is getting good property management. So right now in the, uh, I guess it's the Southeast we're in, um, we have uh, currently working with a property management company that covers a lot of the Southeast. So in a lot of cases, we're asking them if, you know, if they will cover this area. And we've even had um, the company going out to some of the properties to check them out for us. And, you know, respecting their opinion of it, um, seeing if they would manage that for us and um, relying, relying a lot heavier on the property management company. Yeah, that's great. It's great that you guys have that strategic partner and the uh, property manager. I'm sure that helps and uh, helps vet markets and, and sub markets even. So great. Absolutely. So could you talk a little bit about how you've built your team to this point, both external partners, property managers, lenders, and then whatever your team looks like internal to the organization? Well, as far as the external team, I mean, it depends, you know, on, on the area. I've already talked about property managers that we, we contact different property managers and get references. Um, as far as lenders, we have some uh, mortgage brokers that usually you're going to go looking for for a loan for us. So we have them as a resource to go and look in many different areas. Um, in the past, I have gone to directly to uh, an individual bank. Um, it depends on the situation as far as the market. Um, so far, we've been with different lenders every time, depending on the situation. Uh, as far as brokers, you know, we've got a variety of brokers that uh, we've met from many different sources, but most of the deals uh, seem to come with brokers when you're dealing with uh, commercial commercial properties. And then as far as lawyers, um, I have um, received references from either the property manager or from the brokers for a local, uh, when I say a local lawyer, and I mean within state, um, that's the main thing on the lawyers is if I'm going to have a lawyers, uh, for my transaction, I want somebody local to the state. Um, I'm not concerned about them being local to the county or the city, but I want to make sure that they know the state laws and, uh, your city and county ordinances typically aren't, aren't going to, uh, uh interfere with much. And then as far as the syndication, uh, I have, you know, my lawyers that are out in California and uh, it doesn't matter. We're talking federal law, so um, it doesn't matter where they are. Right. Okay. And uh, your investors, can you talk about who those people look like and uh, what those relationships are with those with those types of people? Well, those people are all different people. They're people that I've met somewhere along the way. Um, I have met some of them on different, uh, from different sites that I've been on. Uh, uh, I've met a lot of people through bigger pockets, uh, different other, other podcasts that I've, I've been on. I meet, um, a lot of them from the clubs. I run two different clubs out in California, real estate clubs. I have, uh, investors from those. Um, I have met investors all around different seminars I've gone to. I, I network with people all the time. Uh, I meet investors that way. So I've, I've met them many different ways. Yeah. Great. Thanks Jeff for sharing that. I ask because, you know, when, when people are first getting started out, that seems one of the more daunting tasks is how do I find investors? How do I, you know, find people who are willing to trust me with putting together deals? So just wanted to get a behind the scenes look at, you know, how you've done that. Absolutely. And and the thing is is my the my my students that are working with me now as far as uh, looking at at, at deals um, one of the things that I'm working on with them is uh, to be able to go out and talk to people to talk to their friends to let them know what they're doing and um, you never know who's going to want to invest with you. Um, this group that I've been training, uh, they're the ones that found this, uh, deal in Georgia that we just recently closed on. And this is an immense amount of credibility for them 
when they talk to people and I've told them to use that credibility when they're talking to people, whatever social events they're at and people ask, Hey, what's going on? You know, you can, you can say, Hey, we just, we just bought a, a, a student housing uh, property down in Georgia and uh, we're very excited about what's going on and et cetera, et cetera. And uh, hopefully the, the conversation will turn to, you know, how can I get involved or let's talk about this. I have some money that's sitting around doing nothing. Yeah, absolutely. Having the credibility of that first deal, you know, really goes a long way. And after that, it begins to get easier and easier. So yeah, right. Getting mm-hmm. that, getting the experience of that first deal. And you kind of started to t- touch on it, but you know, you guys have found that thing as a team. So, you know, you get to use the power of we rather than, than just saying, ah, you know, going to the table saying, you know, I don't have the experience with this, but rather we have this experience or we've done this really carries a lot of weight. Oh, absolutely. And the, the amount of credibility that it gets that uh, you're, you're part of the team. I have other, you know, back to what, what the investors look like. I have many investors that have never done a syndication and they want to be on, even if they weren't on the management side, they want to be at least on the, the, the equity partner side just to see what that looked like. And I did that also in the beginning. And I learned what that looked like on the other side. And that taught me a lot of lessons on how to treat my investors uh, on, on the management side. So it's, you know, it's a good thing that it, to go ahead and do and to learn from it. And uh, so some of the investors are in that mainly for that to kind of learn uh, what it looks like on that side of it. And also they have the opportunities to ask all the questions they want about the investment so they can learn as much uh, with with the plans for eventually doing their own syndication. Yeah, great. So circling back to something we said earlier, you talked about when you're analyzing multifamily deals, it's almost like looking at this thing as a business, its own individual business. So how did you get to the point where you can you can look and confidently do your due diligence on, say, a student family project versus a you know a multifamily project in Georgia? You know, how do you uh, overcome you know what you don't know? Well, that comes from experience and. Typically, what I tell people, uh, you know, I mean, I talk to new people all the time in my different clubs, and, you know, you have to kind of open yourself up and figure out what niche is of interest to you. And not everybody is going to go, you know, the same direction. There's so many different directions you can go and places you can make money in real estate. And just listening to these different podcasts, you can see all the different directions uh, people have gone. But once you've kind of got an idea of what direction you want to go, then you've got to go and find, okay, who's an expert either in my area or maybe even out of my area? Somebody that I feel uh, I would like to learn from. And you go find out what you can do to help that person. How can I help you? Can I make phone calls? Can I lick stamps? Can I, you know, uh, you know, feed your dog, walk your, you know, whatever. Um, how can I help you to free up time, you know, so you're going to be more inclined to, to uh, talk to me? Yeah. It's... Because, you know, people like myself are, are busy. Um, so to be, to ask uh, someone come up and ask me to be their, their mentor, you know, it's kind of, that's kind of the wrong way of approaching it. Um, I believe very strongly in the internship, uh, apprentice type of thing where somebody volunteers their time and, uh, and learns the ropes that way and gives back without the expectation of anything uh, in return. And, um, you know, typically there's going to be a lot given back in return, but you go in, you know, not with that expectation, but you go in and say, look, how can I help you? And you learn that way. Um, also once, you know, once you get into a deal, if you're able to get into the deal with that person, um, just helping out, you know, you you can add that to the credibility, even though you weren't the managing partner, um, you can tell people, say, look, we just we just did this deal together. I worked with 
with this guy that's got a lot of experience and I did this deal and you know you do a couple like that you get more and more experience because as you said you don't know what you don't know and what you don't know can very well hurt you yeah right that's that's great advice Jeff I've actually done some of those things you're saying reaching out first off identifying who is out there doing what you want to do reaching out to that person and seeing how you can help them out add value um, you know, I've come across investors who are doing deals in my area and, you know, hey, let me drive by, look at the deal, you know, send you pictures, help you out, you know, send you references, give you the, give you the scoop on this area, things like that. So absolutely, I think uh, providing value and, uh, you know, trying to help give back, like you said, is a, you know, a great tip. Mm-hmm. Okay, Jeff, so uh, what are your future goals with Synergetic Investment Group? Well, we're still in our expansion mode. Uh, we still want to uh, continue to acquire properties. Um, I'm real happy with the student housing, but I wouldn't mind uh, looking into some more in the way of uh, senior housing, senior living, assisted living. Now, on some of those where you're talking about the, the assisted living, we wouldn't be the operators on those, but I wouldn't mind having properties that um, to lease out to operators. But um, senior type of housing is going to um, just continue to increase as my generation continues to get older and older. Um, there's going to be a lot of demand, and there certainly isn't enough uh, facilities for people that are going to need help as they get older. And and we keep getting older and uh, living longer. And so, you know, certainly senior housing is, is a way to go. Yeah, the, the demographics behind that I certainly find interesting. You know, uh, in an aging society like that, you have to start looking at what are the other asset classes are going to be in demand in, say, 10 or 20 years down the road. So, yeah, great foresight. Um, so with your investments through synergetic are you guys typically buying and holding those just in a short term say three to five years as typical or are you holding on to those longer you know it depends on the deal and it depends on the market and it depends on where it is on the cycle um an example uh, the first property we had it was a uh, 20 units it actually was five fourplexes it was in a very slow growth market um the and this was this was a big lesson for us um it was 100 percent occupied it was a three year three year old property so it was practically brand new there wasn't any value adds that we could do except for raising rents and billing back utilities and the billing back utilities uh met with quite a bit of resistance and the raising the rents just wasn't going to happen. And so on that particular property, we were supposed to do a five-year hold. And at, at year four and a half, we started to try to sell it at a price that we thought would bring us a decent return for our investors. And we didn't get that sold until year six uh, because we needed to get that price because there wasn't that much value added to that property uh, that we were going to be able to get a decent return for the investors. So we hung on to it for an extra year. So that's, that's, that's one extreme. Um, we just, this year I sold my property in Houston. It was 62 units that uh, we had bought three years earlier. It was supposed to be a five year hold. Um, but we were, my broker approached me and said, Hey, I can sell this for, we had bought it for 1.3 and he said, Oh, I can sell this for 2.2. And I said, well, I don't want 2.2, even, even though uh, 2.3 is what I told our investors we would sell it for in year five. He said, I can get you 2.2 right now. Yeah. And I said, well, my prepayment penalty is too high. So I didn't want to do that. And then I decided, okay, I'll go and take a look and realize my prepayment penalty was only $100,000, which, which seems like a lot of money. So I told him, I said, look, 
if you go and list it for, well, actually, my I before that I talked to my property manager, and she said, oh yeah, you you should be able to get between two point nine and three point two for this property, and we thought, wow, if we can get that kind of money, it certainly would be worth it. So I told him to list it at two point nine, and we actually actually ended up selling it for 2.7 okay so that was in three years so because the opportunity was there because we had added value to it and the market had uh added value to it by lowering the cap rates um we only held it for three years mainly because i was able to get my investors you know uh, a better return than i had uh told them in the beginning on a five-year hold that I was able to give it to them in a three-year hold. And so because of that, we sold. Um, but typically on a pretty stabilized property, I would go with a five, seven, or 10-year hold. But on a value-add play where you're uh, increasing the value by, by quite a bit, um, that might only be a three-year hold. It's it's going to depend on what's going on with the deal. Um, because the thing is, if you add value to it in the first three years, all you're gonna do is, is dilute the returns in the next two years, because you're not gonna be adding as much value. So your annual return is actually being reduced if I held on to it for another couple of years. So you're better off just getting out in the three years and having a lot of happy, happy investors and going on to the next deal. Right. Great. So you've talked about being in the expansion phase still. Where are you trying to expand to? Well, we're looking at a lot of different markets. Um, as I said, South Carolina, we're looking for still some more in Georgia. Uh, I wouldn't mind having some more in the Ohio area. Um, I've got one of my people who lives out in the Oklahoma area, and so he's looking out there. Um, you know, there's there's a few different areas. I, there's some areas in Florida we're looking. Uh, I wouldn't mind getting back into Texas. I'm out, completely out of Texas right now. Um, I like Houston, uh, except Houston Houston's a tight market. You know, that's why we sold, because I was able to get such a good price. But... If I found something distressed in Houston in a decent neighborhood, I would go back in there. So a few, we're looking at a few different areas. Great, great. So Jeff, you guys are uh, expanding. You're moving along pretty well. What are your reasons why? Why are you doing what you're doing? If you're talking about my personal why? Yes. My, my personal why is something, you know, I mentioned it in the beginning. Um, that I had gone through a divorce and realized that with my, with my ex taking the house, um, that the retirement funds were not going to be su to sufficient to sustain me. Um, and not only that, I wanted to be an asset to my children in my later years and not to be a burden on them. Um, I also have five grandchildren, and I would love to do things with my grandchildren as far as traveling and taking them different places and showing them things. And uh, it wasn't going to happen if I continued on the path that I was going, uh, which was basically a, a high-paying career, um, but it still wasn't, wasn't going to do it. Um, so... I figured that this was the only way that, that I was going to uh, be able to do it is if I had this additional income uh, from real estate. Yeah, great. Just want to point out yeah. that you know, you're know you bringing up the why, and, yes. and that's an extremely, extremely important concept uh, that people have to understand. And I, I can't emphasize it enough that there's many, many times that you're sitting there thinking to yourself, why the heck am I doing this? Uh, I think that a lot of times your on-stage gurus uh, do a di misservice, a disservice to people when they tell them it's easy to, easy to do, that anybody can do it. 
I, I do believe anybody could do it, but it's not easy. And I think when people set their expectations that this is going to be easy, I'm going to be able to do it just like all these other people did it. Um, and then they hit a few bumps in the road. All of a sudden, they're gone. Uh, you need to hang on to that why and have a, a, a strong reason uh, to keep on pushing when you want to do all these other things like everybody else is doing. Um, and instead, you're stuck behind a computer or on the phone calling people or doing all this other stuff. Um, when you really would have rather be you know, out at the beach or at the park or watching TV or whatever it is. Um, so, yeah, you, you need something to, to kick you in the butt that, um, you know, when, um, when you start getting down and thinking that this isn't going to work for you. And, and if I could, I'd like to just relate a little story. Um, there was a gentleman called me um, for one of my club meetings, and he, he lives uh, oh, probably about, mm, I guess, 10, 15 miles from where the club was. And he called me up, and he said, oh, do you ever have any club meetings out, out where I live? And I said, no, no, this is where we have it. I mean, it's, you know, you know, 15 miles away. It's, you know, 10 minutes away from where he is, 15 minutes, something like that. And he said, well, that's, that's really too far for me to go to, to get to the meeting. And I chewed his butt out. I mean, I told him that if you can't manage to drive 15 miles to go to a club meeting, then don't bother to get into real estate. Do not even start, do not even try, because you're just going to totally fail. You have to, I mean, if you don't put out, if you don't attempt uh, to put yourself into uncomfortable situations and drive out somewhere when you don't want to really be there, forget it. It's just not going to happen. I mean, all the times I've driven for three hours in traffic to get to a meeting or get to some event where I would much rather be sitting home doing nothing. Um, that's, that's what it takes to be successful in this business. Yeah, absolutely. For that matter, flying across the country to, you know, inspect a, a new property or, you know, this, uh, this is not an easy game. And I think people have a misconception of real estate investors is just laying on the beach and cash and rent checks. And at least in my experience, it's a lot of work and it's a constant hustle. And if you don't have a reason why to keep you going, then, you know, you hit those hard points and you may never, you may not continue. So I think you're right mm -hmm. by having a powerful reason why. Absolutely. All right. Great stuff, Jeff. That's, that's really awesome and important. So wrapping up, we've got a lightning round. We've just got a series of questions that will fire at you and you just kind of shoot from the hip. So sound good? Sure. Okay. Let's get started then. First question is what was your biggest hurdle getting started in real estate investing and how did you overcome it? Well, the biggest thing was just the fear factor of, you know, just the, the, the extra zeros behind all the numbers and the fear of losing, losing my own money as well as losing somebody else's money uh, was, was very difficult. Um, the way I got over it, a lot of it, I guess, was I had a partner that I was working with um, who was very analytic, uh, very um, uh, detail-oriented, and so we we passed things back and forth between each other and and helped each other past our own fears as far as if we we figured if we both agreed on things then we're probably pretty safe. But we also had mentors. Uh, we both had mentors that we were able to go back and ask them questions and uh, about different situations. So I guess having somebody with experience to bounce things off of um, is is a great resource. And as I mentioned, bigger pockets being a great resource for doing doing that kind of stuff as well. Asking somebody else. When I first started, I didn't know about bigger pockets, but it is it's a great resource. Yeah, absolutely it is. Yeah, it's great to have that sounding board, whether that's a partner or a mentor or just a peer in, in your local investment group. And uh, by surrounding yourself with those types of people, you know, you can help, uh, you know, overcome those fears. Although I feel like they're always out there. So, Oh, absolutely. And the thing is, is, is you push yourself, you push your fears 
And um, I've always done, you know, I've always had a fear in, as far as speaking in front of groups. And then, you know, now I'm speaking in front of groups all the time. You know, it's just you push what's what's nice about pushing yourself into your comfort zone. Once you get past it, then you can move on to the next step. You know, you've 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 now grown. And so you've gone past that and now you can move on to the next thing. Yeah, right. Okay, great. Jeff, do you have a personal habit that contributes to your success? Determination. Good one. I don't know if that's a habit, but I guess but that keeps me going. I'm determined. Uh, I don't I don't quit easily. So that's the drive has, has kept me going. Right. Okay. Do you have an online resource that you find valuable? I suspect what you might say here. Well, there's a lot of podcasts. Uh, obviously, Bigger Pockets is one of them. Um, but there's a lot of things right now with my group. Um, I've been we've been using the program called Slack, which has been our communication resource for a while. Um, so that's kind of an online resource. Um, but, uh, you know, those mainly the, I guess the big thing is the podcast. Uh, I'm always having my team listen to podcasts, read blogs, uh, webcasts, and Zoom is a great resource for me. Um, a lot of times uh, my team uh, uh, can't get together, and uh, so we get together on Zoom and uh, use that to share information and talk. And I do a lot of training on, on Zoom. Right, great. Okay. We'll put those uh, links and references in the show notes. What mm -hmm. book would you recommend to the listeners and why? <sighs> to narrow it down to one book is rather difficult, but there's I mean there there's there's a lot of different books out there. Give us um, a couple if you'd like. Yeah, I think, you know, it, it depends on what stage they're in, but obviously, you know, Rich Dad Poor Dad, you know, gives you the paradigm shift. Uh, as far as a lot of people moving out from the, uh, the W-2 job um, gives you another way of thinking, as well as his, uh, his what is his, his, his quadrant? Cash flow whatever. quadrant. Cash flow quadrant. Yeah, that, those are, are very enlightening. I also um, like the E-Myth. Um, because my big thing is, is to develop systems, to develop ways to pull yourself out of a lot of the day-to-day -day work and get other people to be doing a lot of the, the work that you don't need to do and create systems to do that, uh, working on your business as opposed to in your business. So that that's a great book um, as far as just overall, uh, I guess, business books. Yeah, great. Those those are all fantastic books. So we'll link those in the show notes for, for the audience. All right, and last question. If you were to give advice to your 20-year-old self to get started in real estate investing, what would it be? Well, I think I've already answered this one, but it's uh, find someone that's doing what you want to do and uh, you know find a way of helping them, find a way of being assistance to them to to learn from them. Um, and in fact, I was, I had one of my, my, my interns was a 19 year old that worked with me for a while. He was the one that actually found my Ohio property, um, when we, when we purchased that. But again, it's, it's find someone that's doing what you want to do. And, and I don't care if this is real estate or, you know, anything else, any other kind of business. Find someone that's doing it and then find a way of being ser a service to them and uh, learn from them, them that way. Yeah, great. Great advice. All right, Jeff, we're well, wrapping up here. Uh, what's the best way our audience can connect with you? Well, the best way you can get to, get to my, my website, uh, which is uh, synergeticig.com, uh, S-Y-N-E-R-G-E-T icig.com or you can email me at jeff at synergeticig.com 
Uh, you could also get a hold of me through Bigger Pockets. Uh, I'm on there quite a bit these days. Um, any of those will work. All right, Jeff. Well, we certainly appreciate your time today. I think it was a fantastic interview and a, a lot of lot of great advice. So we'll put your contact information in the show notes for if anybody wants to reach out to you and follow up with any questions they might have. So, Well, thank you very much for having me, and uh, I look forward to hearing this and and hearing hearing some of the other podcasts that you're going to be doing. Yes, absolutely. Sounds great. All right. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. All right. That wraps up our episode today with Jeff Greenberg. I hope you're getting value out of this show. If you like what you've heard so far, I invite you to let me know by leaving a rating and review. Please subscribe to the show to be notified of future episodes. As always, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to contact me at www.jacobairs.com or email me at info at jacobairs.com. Until next time, signing off, I'm your host, Jacob Ayers. You've been listening to the Real Estate Way to Wealth and Freedom podcast, providing you actionable content to build your real estate empire. Nothing on this show should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for personal advice. The opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have a potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of the Real Estate Way to Wealth and Freedom, LLC, exclusively.